Amen. Amen. What in the world is going on out there? That's, it was just supposed to snow? I mean, I'm, I'm done. I, I am officially done. I'm not the only one? All right. It is so good to see everyone, but uh, I have a sober announcement to make. Um, one, uh, uh, Layla, who's, of course, the daughter of uh, Brittany and Hayden, uh, they just got involved in a car accident. And, um, and so we need to go to prayer at this point in time. You know, it's, uh, it's great to tell stories about uh, God's sovereignty when challenges happen. It's when the challenges uh, that are difficult to comprehend, you know, that, that we understand and trust God, and yet we need his help at this point in time. So let's go ahead and go to our prayer. You know, it's amazing this day uh, of technology. We can actually uh, understand what's happening right away. So we will uh, say a prayer this time, and, um, and I think even the lesson is going to help us uh, walk through uh, when times like this happen in our lives. So let us pray. God, we know without a doubt that you're in control. Yet, Father, there are circumstances that happen that does not uh, uh, help us to understand everything that's going on. And, and Father, uh, we want to pray for Brittany and for Hayden and certainly for Layla at this time uh, that as they've been taken to the hospital. Uh, uh, Father, that you uh, be with the doctors, that uh, she will be uh, totally fine and totally okay. We love them so much, and we know you love them more than we ever could. Uh, and yet, Father, it's at times like this that we turn to you and we say, we need your help. And Father, we need for you uh, to watch over them as they recover quickly. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Um, you know, we don't know all that is happening, so no reason to panic. Uh, even when we do know what's happening, there's still no reason to panic. Amen. Uh, but uh, it's always uh, sobering. Of course, some of you may not realize, but Layla is, is uh, uh, just, just about two years old. And uh, she's a young, beautiful girl. And uh, those are always very, very challenging times. Timing is everything. Okay, and that's the title of our lesson here today as we are going to be studying Esther. And um, it has been an absolute awesome and fantastic ride as we have gone through the epic battles uh, in the scriptures. And we're really, really thrilled about seeing God's sovereignty, seeing God's power at work, and entrusting ourselves to him to understand that this is a God that is worthy of our trust because he's so powerful, compassionate, and always in control. Before I, before I continue, I just wanted to share uh, about Clovis and Sharon a little bit. Um, these are servants personified. And uh, in all that they do, uh, they help to serve people in their communities. Clovis is my oldest friend. I'm not saying that because he has so much gray hair. <laughs> God formed in us a relationship in high school that I did not know where it was going. Now, we were not just friends in high school. We were best buddies in high school. We played on the baseball team together. We played basketball at the gym. Uh, we, we did all kinds of stuff together. Uh, God was forming a relationship with us that uh, Clovis, Clovis was an outstanding student, got a whole bunch of awards, and uh, I was jealous and all that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, oh, Clovis gets another award, whatever. <laughs> And, um, and uh, who, what God was doing in that relationship, I never knew. And so when Clovis invited me to come to a Bible discussion group, I said, because Clovis is there, I'm going. And, uh, and to say that the rest is history, he studied the Bible with me, him and a couple other people. And um, on November 2nd, 1986, 
I was baptized into Christ. And uh, to say that my life has been affected uh, so incredibly uh, would be an understatement. And uh, Clovis has been a mentor to me, will always be a mentor to me. Um, he, uh, he is the best Christian I know. Uh, he's a great, great brother that uh, I told him, I often tell him, Clovis, the first 10,000 years in heaven, we're going to fellowship together because we have lived in different cities for so many years. But it's great to have you here. It's uh, great for you to come and visit. And I'm sorry about the snow. <laughs> I have no control over that. And Sharon is uh, an absolute incredible servant of Christ. Uh, what she does is, is serve people over and over and over and over again. And uh, when I grow up, I want to be just like them. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to share that. Uh, that uh, and I'll share a couple more things even as we're going through our lesson here today. But timing is, ever, uh, is everything. I don't know if you know this, but in the book of Esther, God is not mentioned. Nowhere in the book of Esther. You will see clearly that because God is not mentioned by name, it doesn't mean that he's not working. No, no, let me say it again. Not because God is not evident by name, that doesn't mean he's not working in our lives. And we will see clearly in the book of Esther, that's why there was the, some debate whether or not the book of Esther should be canonized in the scriptures. As a matter of fact, Jesus is one, Jesus, the book of Esther is one of the few books in the Bible that Jesus did not quote from or did not refer to. And so that's what people were wondering, should it be? You'll see after we're done, you'll be convinced without a doubt, not only should it be there, there are lessons in there for us in a remarkable way. Now, context, of course, is everything when we're studying the scriptures. And as we're doing these epic battles, I pray that you are getting an overview of what the, 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 the Old Testament and the timing of it. So I'll put this into context when the book of Esther was written and how ought we to understand it and so we can be inspired and encouraged about what is going on. In about 1450 B.C., Moses on Mount Sinai received the law. Okay? They got it. Amen. We realize they're going to have the mass exodus. Then in about 1031 B.C. to about 931 B.C., David and Solomon reigned in Israel. It was the United Kingdom. It was the heyday. Right, it's awesome. They've conquered all the places that need to be conquered. All the, uh, the guys were in their uh, land that they needed to be in. It was a great time. Shortly after, Israel divides. Problems occur. Major issues. Northern and southern uh, Israel. 722 BC, Assyria conquered northern Israel. 586 BC. Babylon destroys Jerusalem and scatter the Israelites. About 40 years later, we realize Cyrus defeats Babylon, takes over, and then says to the, to the uh, to the Israelites, you can go back to Jerusalem. Of course, that's the time of Nehemiah, and, and they went back and built the walls of Jerusalem because it was in ruins. However, not all the Israelites chose to go back to Jerusalem. Some stayed where they were at. And that's here is the context of the book of Esther. These Jews did not go back to Jerusalem for whatever reason. I'm not sure all the reasons why one day we'll, we'll understand it in the better by and by, uh, so to speak. But they decided to stay there. Some of the great lessons we're going to see is that God cares for all his people. It doesn't matter if you're in the big city or you're in the small city. That God cares for all his people. And the incredible 
providential reign of our God is simply stunning. And all these coincidences, tongue firmly in cheek, all these coincidences will serve as God working out His sovereign will in people's lives. There's no doubt in my mind, when I started to attend Parkdale Collegiate Institute, go Panthers, <laughs> that one of the first people that befriended me was Clovis. And this coincidence materialized into the saving of my soul. And prayerfully has had an impact on other people's lives. I don't know all that you may be enduring or may be excitingly be going through right now. All the relationships you have formed. But the Bible tells us that God puts us in the places exactly where we should be. Exactly where we should be. And I'm telling you there are times I don't believe that. Because it doesn't make any sense. This week, Friday, bam, God, someone hit me. Car. Then after, after I swear I'm calling the police, um, the guy started pushing me. I'm not, not talking a little bit. Because he said I hit him. And it was funny that he said that because he literally, I was traveling in Carlick, he came and hit me. And, uh, and then it, the cops came and it's all good. Um, you know, more importantly, um, I'm totally fine. <laughs> Who cares about the car? It's just a car. I mean, we can, get another, we can get another one, right? But the idea that God is, but I don't know why eventually I'm going to understand why did that happen? I don't know what you're going through. And why is it happening? But I know this, that as we study the Bible and we see God at work, and we see in whom we can place our trust, it ought to invigorate our life and to live our life with faith. Not with absolute glee all the time. That's not going to happen. You're going to see in a moment that is not the journey home. I thought it was when I became a Christian. My life is going to be so awesome. Everything now is so great. Man, why would people not want to live this life? As I've lived as a Christian for 33 years, I am telling you I understand a lot more now why people wouldn't want to live this life. That's just the truth. And I understand more than ever that we get to have a relationship with God. It's an honor and a privilege. And that as we walk on this journey in our lives, our God is ever faithful to His people. So let's turn to Esther. As we see the timing, truly is everything. It's Esther chapter 1. So I'll give you a little bit of context of where we are in, in um, timing. This is about 100 years after the exile. Some of the... Some of the uh, uh, Israelites did not go back to Jerusalem, but rather stayed in the place that they were at for whatever reason. And, and so we pick it up. What happens here is that uh, King Xerxes is throwing a big time party. Apparently that's what he does. What he did was uh, for 180 days, he showed uh, the entire uh, peoples all that he had amassed, all a whole bunch of stuff. Honestly, it's not unlike 
military parades that people have today to show the military power that they have, sometimes the nuclear testing, don't mess with us, so to speak. He was showing all the officials what was going on. Then after that, after this 180 day, half a year, he decides to throw a party. And he throws a seven day party. It's awesome. The Bible tells us that there was so much drinks going on. He said, don't stop people, whatever they want, just give it to them. <coughs> this was a happening party. And it says in verse 10, chapter 1, On the seventh day when King Xerxes was in high spirits from wine, he commanded the seven eunuchs who served him, Mehuman, Bitha, Harbona, Bitha, Abaktha, Zethar, and Carcass to bring him before Queen Vashti wearing her royal crown in order to display her beauty to the people and nobles, for she was lovely to look at. But when the attendants delivered the king's command, Queen Vashti refused to come. Then the king became furious and burned with anger. Oh, Mr. Xerxes. He was having a party. He said, hey, listen, I've got a trophy wife. And I just want to show her off to people. He was high in spirits. He was parading her. And she said, listen, I will not be paraded around. I'm not an object for people to just display at their pleasure. And she refused to come. Good old humble Xerxes said, OK, you're right. I was wrong. That's not, that's not quite what he said. Get rid of her. His friends. His lovely counselors with him says, she, this is what she did. You have any idea how all the women now are going to act in, in, in our land because she's now refusing to obey her? We've got to get rid of her. She absolutely is going to have to be punished and she cannot be, this kind of, you cannot condone this. Good old Xerxes says, okay, I'm going to listen to you guys and then we are going to get rid of her. Chapter 2. In verse 1, later when King Xerxes' fury had subsided, he remembered Vashti and what she had done and what he had decreed about her. Then the king's personal ascendants proposed, let a search be made for, a, for beautiful young virgins for the king. And so literally, they had an incredibly vast land. The Bible tells us from India to Kush. 127 provinces they ruled. He says, I want some young, beautiful virgin to replace Vashti. And so that's what happens. They search for, uh, for a replacement in verse 17. We see what happens. <coughs> Excuse me. Now the king was attracted to Esther more than any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. By the way, the timing of this is about four years later. So coincidentally, upon this drunk guy's request, led to, Va uh, to Esther becoming queen, queen of Persia. And so we see all the things that were happening. In verse, ni chapter, uh, in verse 19, it says, When the virgins were assembled the second time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. So Mordecai is Esther's cousin. Okay? And he was apparently a little older than she was. And so he actually took care of her, the Bible tells us, as his own daughter. Loved her, took care of her. Esther's parents died. We don't know exactly how she died, but she died. She was left as an orphaned girl, and Mor Mor uh, Mordecai picked her up and said, I'm going to take care of you. Once again, these seemingly atro uh, 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 atrocities that happen in people's lives, and we're going to see what God is going to do with it. But Esther, in verse 20, says, had kept her family, background, and nationality just as Mordecai had told her to do, for she continued to follow Mordecai's instructions as she had done when he was bringing her up. During that time, Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate. Bigthana and Tesh, modern-day Biggie and T, okay? 
two of the king's officer, uh, officers who guarded the doorway became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. When the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles, and all this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. And so what's happening here? Mordecai, coincidentally, overhears a plot to kill King Xerxes. Mordecai says, I'm going to tell Queen Esther. Queen Esther didn't say, okay, I'm going to, this is important information. I'm going to embrace this at my own. I'm going to plagiarize, and I'm going to tell uh, King Xerxes. He said, no, no, no. We're going to give credit where credit is due, and we're going to say, Mordecai. So apparently these guys were, uh, were not going to take anyone's um, word for it. He says, let's investigate if this is actually true. They investigated it after the truth, and they actually had a record of it. Just took note. These are things that are happening that are going to form a crescendo to see how God is working in Esther and the people of uh, the, the Jews who were living there in Susa. So we continue in, uh, in chapter 3. We are now introduced to a guy by the name of Haman. Haman was a guy who was remarkably in charge of a lot of King Xerxes' responsibilities, especially there in Susa, where they were living. Haman was an egotistical guy. He loved for people to bow down whenever he worked. He walked around them. Yes, Mr. Haman. Yes, Mr. Haman. When, when someone didn't, he would get really upset. He had a self-inflated view of himself. And so what happened was, we pick it up in verse 5, in chapter 3. When Haman saw that Mordecai would not kneel down or pay him honor, he was enraged. Yet having learned who Mordecai's people were, he scorned the idea of killing only Mordecai. Instead, Haman looked for a way to destroy all Mordecai's people, the Jews, throughout the whole kingdom of Xerxes. So, if it weren't bad enough that Haman was upset at Mordecai, he says, I am going to kill him, his family, and all who were associated with him. I'm going to destroy all these people. He says to Xerxes, he says, listen, these people show no respect, goes to King Xerxes, and he says, I am going to destroy this. And by the way, just to incentivize it, I'm going to give you, get this, 680,000 pounds of silver. Do the math. It's about $175 million this guy had. He was just going to give. Now, doesn't in the case that's all this money. It's amazing what money does. How it gets a hold of people. And it's remarkable. He says, we're going to destroy all these people. In chapter... 3 verse 13, and this is what it says. Dispatches were sent by couriers to all the king's provinces with the, with the order to destroy, kill, and annihilate all the Jews, young and old, men and women, on a single day, the, ter the 13th day of the 12th month, the month of Adar, and to plunder their goods. By the way, this is not an in-depth study of the book of Esther. We'll, we'll do those kinds of studies. These, these studies that we're having here are, are what they call surveys. We, over, we tell the story so you understand the context of, and we get the gist of it. But little, little things like this, okay? The 13th month, the 13th day of the 12th month, Adar. Well, why was that important? Well, you see, when they started thinking about it, it was actually the first month. From the time they said they were going to do it, it was going to be 12 months. When, he, when they were going to actually destroy all the Jews. They sent out the letter, 12 months later, they were going to do it. That's an, another important thing to understand. And how did they determine it was going to be the 12th month? They threw lots. 
Coincidentally, it took time. Coincidentally, you're going to see how God is going to work through all of this. So these are important steps to the story. In chapter 4, we find out that Mordecai would not be consoled when he heard about this news. Let me say something that is very important. There is a time for us to have a time where we have holy discontentment. Mordecai was disturbed about the news he heard. You know what? Esther, his lovely cousin, was trying to encourage him. Sent him clothes, sent him stuff. Says, don't feel bad, don't feel bad. Mordecai refused to be consoled. Let me ask you a question. Just This is just a side note. What can you be not consoled about? There's some things you ought to be. I don't want you to make me feel better. Because there's nothing to feel better about. Is it what we talked about a little bit? Perhaps the greatest crime against humanity is how women have been treated. Statistically, that one in four women have been molested sexually. They're seen as objects. And so much is that? Or is it the, the needy and the poor among us? Man, if we decide, we think resources are an issue in this world, it's not. If we were to stop doing some things, we could solve the world's education, health, water problem in the entire world. What is it? that we're inconsolable about. The people will spend eternity in hell. What is it? What atrocity? Or do we just go about, we look at it on the news, and we just hope somebody makes a change? Mordecai heard about the destruction of his people, and he says, I will not be consoled. Verse 4, when Esther eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to, be, uh, to put on instead of a sackcloth, but he would not accept them. Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and why. She says, why is he so upset. And Mordecai says, listen, we are at a crossroads in life. Destruction is about to happen. Esther tells Mordecai what the deal is. Interestingly, Esther was King Xerxes' queen. But apparently, he didn't see her all the time. As a matter of fact, she says, I haven't seen him in 30 days. He has to give me permission to come and see him. That's kind of crazy. But that's the way they live. She said, I don't know if I'm going to have an audience with King Xerxes. And this is what Mordecai said to her, and perhaps so the most famous verses in the Bible, it says this, uh, in the book of Esther, rather, in verse 12. 
It says, when Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, she comes back to him and says, I I'm not sure if I can do this. I I I'm not sure what to do. I mean, I, 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 I can't do anything. He sent back this answer. Stunning. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your family's father's family will perish. And who knows that you have come to your royal position for a time, for such a time as this. This is, this is one of the scriptures that I don't think a lot of us in the Christian world quite comprehend. Mordecai says, you really think because you live in the king's palace, you're going to escape the wrath? As a matter of fact, Oh, have no doubt, Esther. God will accomplish what needs to be accomplished. The question begs, are you going to be a part of it? You see, I have no doubt that God is, let's be saying. Sometimes we have this self, self-promoted kind of attitude that God needs me. Oh, before we chuckle, I think there was a time that I think that. That I think that if I don't do it, then nobody will. I've been given charge of this country and we're going to, we're going to evangelize and if we don't know it, nobody will. That's not what Mordecai says there. He says, no, oh, it's going to be done. Esther, you get to be a part of it. And if you don't get to be a part of it, you're missing out. You are missing out. The question begs for the hope of Ottawa. It's not well enough God's world word is going to be returned void. That's not going to happen. Well enough God's will will be accomplished. Oh, it will be. The question begs, are we going to be a part of it? That's the question. And that's what he says to Esther. Listen, Esther, I appreciate the heart and everything. But how do you know that you were not here for a time such as this? My wife is going to come up and share a couple of things and really clean up all the mess that I made, and then uh, I'll, I'll close that in a few minutes. <laughs> um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is an amazing book. It's actually one of my favorite books in the Bible, um, partly because I'm a woman, <laughs> and um, it, it, it displays the character of a woman that I desire to imitate. Um, as we were talking about the sermon, and I did a little bit of study, um, I came across a phrase, um, and it's simply this, um, in referring to Esther, God, when God is omnipotently present, even when he is conspicu conspicuously absent, and the omnipotence of God speaks of his all-powerfulness, and conspicuous means standing out as to be clearly visible. So the conundrum is, if God is ever present and all-powerful, and he is conspicuous in that when God is there, he's clearly there. <laughs> Why do we have this issue, right? Why do we struggle the way that we do when we know these things? The only, the, the way that I kind of process it is, I, I, I'll tell you a little story about me, and then I'll close out a little bit. Um, I grew up in South Africa in apartheid, and um, you know, if you know anything about apartheid, it was it was um, legislated slavery <laughs> and a caste system, and um, it wasn't good. It wasn't pleasant. Um, I didn't know I lived in that um, because of my parents. My parents did a really great job of not 
making that an obvious thing in our lives. Um, even though my mom was, she's a radical woman and was very political and did things that could have gotten herself in prison. Um, and during apartheid, if you were ever um, charged with a crime against the government, you went to prison for however long they chose to put you there. So, but even despite all this, I, I never knew that. My parents sacrificed, we moved to Canada, and I grew up, I think, relatively simple. I did, we didn't have a very complicated life. Um, if you want to categorize it, we were kind of a blue collar family, um, hardworking parents coming to a new country, trying to make a new living. Um, God was a part of my life. Uh, I went to church uh, every now and then, and, and I believed in God. There came a point in my life where I started rebelling and doing my own thing. To make a long story short, when I turned 19, I got pregnant. I was not married. Uh, this was devastating in my home. I am the only girl. I have two brothers. I, uh, my father is a very uh, old school, strict guy. And this literally devastated him. And I think for... I don't know how long. It took him a long time to recover. Um, but I tell you that story because when that happened to me, I did not think God was anywhere to be found. I thought he, you know, I used to say things like, okay, I know I did something wrong, but girls at my school, they've done way worse things. <laughs> they've slept with way more people. And they're happy and doing great, and their lives are awesome. And I find a guy, and I sleep with him, and I get pregnant. And I was mad at God. Because if you really are all-powerful, why did you let this happen to me? And not her, or her, or her, or her. And it wasn't until about 18 months later that my older brother, who had started going to this church, invited me to church, that I realized, had I not had my son, I would not be a Christian. And here's the reason why. I had standards that I believed were right. No sex before married, I broke it. Every standard that I had, I broke, I broke, I broke. It's all good. <laughs> This one thing that happened to me humbled me. It humbled me. So much so that the re one of the main reasons I turned to God was I said to myself, I have messed up my life so much, I have nothing to teach this young child. Nothing. I don't want to teach him my values. And so I said, I need to change, if for no other reason, than to give him something as a young man that he could be proud of. And even to this day, when sometimes he struggles with his identity and, you know, like, why would a guy not, his biological father, why would he not want to be injured? And he suffer, struggles with some self-esteem at times. I remind him, what happened was not a mistake. God was not absent. In fact, you are the reason, you are the reason I chose to follow God if it wasn't for you, if you didn't come into the world the way that you came in, I wouldn't be a Christian. You wouldn't have an amazing dad like you have. You would not have the siblings you have, and you certainly would not have had the life that you have now. And so when God, this omnipotent, omnipotent God, all-powerful, seems to be absent in our lives, he's probably working all the more. And, you know, somebody said... Um, when a teacher speaks, the students are silent. Sometimes we don't see God that way. And I just very quickly want to say this, because this was the week of celebrating women and highlighting women's needs, um, I was doing a lot of reading, right, about needs and, and praying about how I, uh, as the women's ministry leader, can meet your needs and talking to different sisters. And I was with Jamila, and she brought up this story that she had heard about forgiveness. Um, because forgiveness is very much on my heart. Um, the wanting to, you know, have it in my own sphere, but communicate that as I get together with different women. 
She told me about this really quite unbelievable story and I had to go research it for myself because it was so unbelievable. It was about this woman, her and her family went, this is a true story, went on a camping trip. Um, as they were sleeping in their tent at night, a man came and cut a hole in their tent and took their seven-year-old daughter. They woke up in the morning, their daughter was gone. It was, as you can imagine, devastating. Next several days, the FBI were searching for their daughter, could not find her. The husband and the, the children had to go home and she stayed to kind of help them to find her daughter. Time went on, they could not find her daughter. And this woman said to her husband one day, she said, if they found this man and he was in front of me, even if you were punished, I would kill him with my bare hands. And I said, I can relate, <laughs> I, I would do the same. And she said to herself, I don't want to be this person. I, I can't live this way. I don't want to live with this kind of rage and bitterness in my heart. And she searched and she asked God, what can I do? And she said, you know what? I can pray for this man every day. And so she did. Started off with little things. I don't know where he is, God, but today... Let him feel the sunshine on his face. If he's seeking for a job, let him get the job. Like simple things. And she did that for an entire year. She goes on a program, ABC, uh, on, on the channel ABC, and this man sees it. And he calls her because she had pleaded with him, if you have my daughter, if, please, you know, let me know. And he calls her. And he taunts her. He, he, he ridicules her and mocks her and taunts her. And unbeknownst to her, because she's in her painful world praying for this man every day, missing her daughter, unbeknownst to her, God had literally transformed her heart. So as she's talking to this man and he is raging, she says, I can only imagine how difficult of a time this has been for you because it's been really difficult for me. They end the conversation, and I guess, no, no, they don't end the conversation. They continue to talk, and I guess he feels so whatever by her response that he starts to talk about her daughter, and he says, I actually killed your daughter a week after I took her, and this is where she's buried, and he gave, he gave enough information that they could find the daughter. Not only did they find the daughter, but they were, they were able to find, I guess through her conversation with him, they were able to find the bodies of three other women. And this guy was convicted and put in jail. And he experienced so much sorrow for what he did. He was 22 years old, young guy. He ended up committing suicide. This remarkable woman, in response to his suicide, doesn't say, yay, the world is rid of one more evil person, reaches out to the parents, to, her, to his parent and to the parents of the other children who were lost by this man. And to this day, according to the article, to this day, they meet together. They keep each other strong. They keep each other faithful. And I think about that, and I think... If there's ever a case where you think God is absent, it's that. And yet because one woman made one small choice, who knows how many other lives were saved? This was a serial killer in the making, right? And she brought mercy to this guy. She brought mercy to his family. And it's funny, um, a sister in our congregation wrote a book on forgiveness and asked, called this woman up and asked if she could use her story. And this woman said, share whatever you want, share, you know, but she said, please don't share the name of this gentleman out of respect for his family. I was so moved by that to remember our all-powerful God is always working. Amen. Who knows 
what God is intending with your decisions. Who knows the ripple effect of the positive and courageous decisions that you're going to make as Esther made in this time? Do you trust God enough that you have been put in a position for a time such as this? And this way, we're not going to go about our lives aimlessly. You know, I think we've heard a lot today. I'm going to wrap it up with this. We find out that Haman wanted to destroy all the Jews because this was this woman's decision. She was put in a position ultimately that Haman and the evil that he has done, that the people the Jewish people were saved because of her decision in her life. As a matter of fact, it says in chapter 8, verse 17, we'll close with this. I, I, I know um, I had a lot more scriptures, but that's okay. We'll close with this. I think the essence of what has been said will be said, have been said. It says this in verse, chapter 8, verse 14. Um, sorry, verse 17. It says, in every province and in every city to which the edict of the king came, there was joy and gladness among the Jews with feasting and celebrating, and many people of other nationalities became Jews because fear of the Jews had seized them. These, when there was a time they were going to be annihilated, it was so turned around because of this woman's decision. Now people secretly wanted to become Jews because of who these people are. See how God makes things awesome? And this was the birth of the Purim festivals. It's a remembrance of God's faithfulness to them. November 2nd, 1986, I was baptized into Christ. Every November 2nd, I give Clovis a call. And I say, thank you for reaching out to me. Thank you for help. That's my Purim. It's a day of remembrance. I'll never forget it. Thank you for rescuing me from a dominion of darkness. Every single day I call the person who brought me to Christ on November 2nd. You see, that's the way God works. In chapter 10 and verse 3, we'll close, and this is what it says. Mordecai the Jew was second in rank to King Xerxes, preeminent among the Jews, and held in high esteem by his fellow Jews because he worked for the good of his people and spoke up for the welfare of all the Jews. What an epitaph. What does yours say right now? I love to play video games and really buy things for myself. I spent four hours on my hair. <laughs> Chris, is, how is that how long you spend on your hair over there? You spend, need to spend a little bit more time if it's just four hours. <laughs> but church, as we see the overall picture of how God worked in Esther's lives and the people and the sea, even though his name is not mentioned, that he was absolutely unequivocally present. And all these, all these coincidences, you know how the king came to realize it was Mordecai and he issued the, 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 the opportunity for Esther? He couldn't sleep one night. So he said, hey, can you guys help me to sleep by reading the old records, the newspapers? <laughs> and he said, someone did this? What happened to that guy who reported that I was going to be killed? Nothing. They said, okay, let it be done for him. Let's celebrate him. Let's appreciate him. All these coincidences. So let me ask you a question. What coincidence brought you here today? What did God say to you today? What is God saying to you today? Who knows? 
that you were put in a position for times such as this. I didn't know when this skinny little guy from Guyana was attending Parkdale Collegiate and was befriend this kind, kind young man. What was happening? Timing is everything, and it's not coincidental. All these stories, 